Hi girls, it's Miss Gaska. Today I'm going to teach you about English 2 Semester 1 Week 2, Activity 1.6, Two Perspectives on Cultural Identity. This video may be a little long because it has several different sections in this activity. So if you need to take a break and step away, come back a little bit later, feel free to do so. So our learning targets for this activity are to analyze a particular point of view regarding a cultural experience expressed in literature and art, and to compare and contrast the representation of a subject in different media. So, in this activity, you will analyze multiple media, a film clip, a biography, a painting, and a poem, to compare and contrast perceptions of cultural identity. So viewing a film is the first thing that you'll do. In preparation for a discussion on the life, art, and culture of Frida Kahlo, you'll be watching a short PBS film clip called The Life and Times of Frida Kahlo. Um, this is going to be posted on Edmodo for you. Take notes on the key issues and details that help you understand Kahlo's life, art, and cultural identity. So let's look at the setting of purpose for reading. These are the things that you should be doing while you're reading this next excerpt. Also, for the take notes part on the identity thing, you could write them over here in the my notes section. So setting a purpose for reading. As you read a brief introductory excerpt from Hayden Herrera's biography, Frida, a biography of Frida Kahlo, use metacognitive markers to mark the text. As you mark the text, focus on details emphasized that help you understand Frida's or Kahlo's life, art, and cultural identity. So when it says metacognitive markers, I just want to refresh you on what those markers are here on the side. So to begin with, you have an exclamation point, which stands for something that's surprising or something that's new uh, knowledge to you, something you've never heard of before. A question mark is something that's confusing or something that makes you come up with a question. And it doesn't have to be a question about comprehension. It could be a question about wanting more detail, something like that. Um, there's also an asterisk, which is the little star when you do shift eight on your keyboard. And it means you have a comment on something. There is a heart. I'm gonna use the less than three to make my heart. And this means it's your favorite part. And then there, last but not least, there's LOL, which means obviously it's a funny part. So, those are the metacognitive markers that you'll use to annotate this text. Now, another thing that you're going to be um, doing is circling unknown words and phrases and try to determine the meaning of those words by using context clues, word parts, or a dictionary. So let's get started. I'm going to read the first paragraph with you and show you how I would use metacognitive markers. Then the rest is up to you to continue annotating in order to get full credit for your assignment. Let's begin. In April 1953, less than a year before her death at the age of 47, Frida Kahlo had her first major exhibition of paintings in her native Mexico. All right, hold on. I have a couple of things that I wanted to point out here. First of all, she died at 47? That's so young. Um, and also her first major exhibition of paintings was around the time she was 47. That's what I'm understanding because it says less than a year before her death. So. Why didn't she have any kind of recognition as a painter before that is one of my questions. So um, 47, I find that surprising. And I also have a question, which is what did she die of? Why, like, why did she die so young? And then over here, my first, uh, her first major exhibition of paintings, I find that surprising. And I also wonder why she didn't get recognition before that. Because that's a pretty late uh, time in life to start getting acknowledged for your artwork. So by that time, her health had so deteriorated that no one expected her to attend. But at 8 p.m., just after the doors of Mexico City's Gallery of Contemporary Art opened up to the public, an ambulance drew up. The artist, dressed in her favorite Mexican costume, was carried on a hospital stretcher to her four-poster bed, which had been installed in the gallery that afternoon. The bed was bedecked as she liked it, with photographs of her husband, the great muralist Diego Rivera, and of her political heroes. Paper mache skeletons dangled from the canopy, and a mirror affixed to the underside of the canopy reflected her joyful, though ravaged, face. One by one, 200 friends and admirers greeted Frida Kahlo, then formed a circle around the bed and sang Mexican ballads with her until well past midnight. So I have a few other things that I want to point out to you guys. So um, I want to point out that 
she had a bed set up in her hospital gallery that, and not only was it a normal bed, but it had like photographs all over it and it had a mirror on the bottom of it and paper mache skeletons. Like she was being, whoever set this bed up for her or whether it was due to her, um, her requests, like this is super extra in terms of setting up for an art gallery. Um, so I'm gonna put an asterisk there um, because my comment is like, wow, this is really over the top. Um, also, the friends forming a circle around her and singing ballads with her until well past midnight, I have a comment there too, which is like, it sounds more like a party than an art exhibit. So that's how you use the metacognitive markers. I also want to show you what words I would probably circle in this paragraph based on um, understanding. So I don't know if you guys are familiar with the word deteriorated, but you could likely figure out what it means based on context clues. Um, and then it says that you may not be familiar with a four poster bed. If you've never heard of a four poster bed before, you may want to look up pictures of it so you can see what they're talking about. Um, the bed was bedecked. Um, so bedecked is another word that you can probably figure out um, using context clues. Paper mache. I know you know what paper mache is, but I wanted to point out the spelling. Paper mache comes from a French term, which is why the spelling's a little weird. They don't spell paper the same way we do. They add an I right before the E because it's pronounced papier. So in French, this would be papier mache, um, whereas in English, it's paper mache. And then we have affixed. I don't know if you know the word affixed, but you could probably figure out what it means based on the way it's being used. Ravaged. And then um, you may or may not know what ballads are, so I'm just gonna circle that just in case. So as you continue reading your short uh, article, biography, biographical article, go ahead and continue to annotate the way that I've just showed you and meet me down in the question section. Go ahead and pause the video, finish reading and annotating, and then come down, come back and you'll meet me there. So let's look at the questions. For number one, it says, based on details in paragraph one, what inference can you make about Frida Kahlo's character and personality? So you're gonna wanna go back to paragraph one and look at the way she's being described. Look at the things that they're saying about her. What does that tell you about what she's like as a person? That's what this question is really asking you. What do those details they give you in paragraph one tell you about Frida Kahlo? For number two, Using context clues from paragraphs two and three to determine the meaning of the word alegria as it applies to Kahlo's personality. So you may not be able to figure out what this word is. You may be able to um, based on the context clues, but if you can't figure it out, go ahead and look it up so that you know what it means and then go back and figure out how it applies to her personality based on what you've read in those two paragraphs. For number three, it says, choose a line of text that best characterizes the biographer's opinion of Frida Kahlo's art and explain your understanding of the opinion. So opinion is something that can be different depending on who is talking. So you need to be looking specifically for something the author says that other people may be able to argue against in terms of like the quality of her art and then explain why you think that. For number four, in paragraph six, the author describes an exhibition of Kahlo's work as a strange sort of homage for it seemed to celebrate the exotic personality and story of the artist rather more than it honored her art. So how does this statement help develop the central idea of the text? So the first thing you need to do to answer that question is determine what the central idea of the text even is. Now you could say, if I asked you, what is this text about? You could say Frida Kahlo. Okay, well, what about Frida Kahlo? What, what point are they trying to make about Frida Kahlo? Frida Kahlo's life. Okay, what about Frida Kahlo's life? Like, what are they trying to say about it? Frida Kahlo's life was blah, blah, blah. Then once you have figured out what the central idea of that text is, go back and try to figure out what this line does to develop that point. How does that line contribute to that point? And then that will offer you your answer for that. So then for number five, it says, what co connection does the author make between the outer Frida and the inner one of her art? So you're going to be looking at how she presents herself, how other people see her, and that's what they mean by the outer Frida, the Frida that the world sees. 
And then you're going to be looking for how she portrays her thoughts and feelings and the things that are inside her through her artwork, according to this author. And that's where you're going to get the information from that. For number six, how does the author develop her ideas about Rio Kahlo and her art? So here, you're thinking, um, it's asking more about the structure. So how does the author set up those ideas to build that central message that she's trying to tell you? Now it says, organize your notes from both texts, the film clip and the informational text, so that you can, we're not having a discussion, have well-reasoned text-based responses to address her life, art, cultural identity. So I want you to answer these questions. You could do so on the notes section over here. Um, but what did you learn about Frida Kahlo's life, art, and cultural identity? What details are emphasized in each text to support your interpretation of this artist and how she depicts her cultural identity in her work? And then make sure that you cover well-reasoned ideas and use textual evidence to support uh, responses to or support your responses to these questions. So these are the things you're going to be focusing on when you're making these notes over here in the side. These um, three questions and making sure that you meet these two bullet points in terms of how you structure them. For writing the sources explanatory text, what you're supposed to do is explain how Kahlo expresses her cultural identity in her art, drawing on examples from both sources. So in your writing, be sure that you do the following. Begin with a clear thesis that states your position. Include a clear definition of Kahlo's cultural identity as you understand it. Include direct quotations and specific examples from the text to support your claims and introduce and punctuate all quotations correctly. Include transitions between points and a concluding statement, and vary, vary your syntax using a variety of sentence types. Now this only has to be an extended paragraph, it doesn't have to be a whole essay, but you do have to make sure you hit all four of these points. Um, we're not going to be using this activity, so I'm going to cross it out, and then let's keep going. So here we have a picture to look at, but I wanted to point out this about the artist section. Now I know I don't always read these with you, but this one is particularly important. So in 1930, Frida Kahlo's husband, Diego Rivera, received several commissions to paint murals in the United States, causing them to move from Mexico to this country. After three years in the United States, Frida was homesick and longed to return to Mexico. The tension between living in one world and longing to be in another inspired her painting, self-portrait on the borderline between Mexico and the United States. So as we look at this picture, I'm going to point out several things that I noticed using my arrow tool. So I wanted to point out that here we have a sun with a face and a moon with a face. In ancient Aztec culture, which um, the Aztecs came from what's now Mexico, they believed that the sun and the god were, or sun and the moon were like gods that ruled over everybody in the world. Um, this is an example of some ruins of a temple, which is like a religious structure, and it was very culturally significant to the Aztecs as well. Um, here, I don't know the significance of these, uh, this thing, maybe it's stones. Um, we have a skull lying on its side. We have a little statue of a naked person, and a l another little statue of a naked person. We have some flowers, and we have some roots. And this is all on the Mexico side, okay? So. On this other side, I have an American flag, but it's partially obscured by the smoke. I have uh, what looks to be like buildings in a city. I have smokestacks um, that say Ford on them, like the auto industry. I'm not quite sure what these things are supposed to be. Um, they look kind of weird. And then down here, I have. Um, these electrical appliances like lamps, fans, things like that that are plugged into this box that she's standing on. And then here we have some wires, cords, and they're connecting over here with the roots. And I also wanted to point out in her hands, her arms are crossed. And one arm is holding the Mexican flag and the other arm is holding a cigarette. So we have her standing in the middle of the picture and I'm going to just 
divide this picture. It's not exactly in half, but you kind of get the idea. And maybe more like that. So we have two sides to this picture. I wanted to also point out that how here they have the gods that were worshipped in the Aztec cultures. I think she's also implying that America is worshipped in America um, as a god in its own right, in an unusual type of way. And also there's a lot of balance in this picture. Um, things over here mostly have things that correspond with them on this side, like how this temple is equal to these buildings or these gods are equal to this flag, things like that, these roots. So look at here, it says, um, like literature, art is a medium that intends to communicate to an audience. Just as every literary work is a conversation waiting to happen, so is a work of art waiting for a listening audience. As a viewer and reader of art, you must consider the elements of the art before making an interpretation. So in order to do that, we're going to use the optic strategy. So optic is an acronym for overview, parts, title, interrelationships, and conclusion. It's a strategy that will allow you to analyze visual texts like paintings, photographs, advertisements, maps, charts and graphs, and developing an interpretation regarding the meaning or themes of the text. So down here we have the chart that we're supposed to use. So for the title of piece, we could go back up. The title is self-portrait on the borderline between Mexico and the United States. I'm just going to type that on that line for you so you can see it. So self-portrait on the borderline between Mexico and the United States. So I don't know why it doesn't like that, but that's annoying. Okay, so the artist is Frida Kahlo. It's Frida Kahlo. And then the type of artwork is a painting. So look at the artwork for at least 10 seconds. Well, we already did that. Generate questions that you have about the artwork, such as the following. What is the subject? What strikes you as interesting, odd, etc.? What is happening? So I'm going to start off with a question of my own, and then it's up to you to come up with your own questions. This section is for you to ask questions, not for you to have to answer them. So right now you're just generating questions. So for me, I want to know what are the objects on the right hand side of the painting in the middle. So those things I said, I don't really know what they are um, on my right hand, not Frida's. I kind of am curious to know what they are. So you can ask whatever questions you want, just add to what I've um, already put. Then here it says, look closely at the artwork, making note of important elements and details. Well, we already did that. Add additional questions such as the following. Who are the figures? What is the setting and time period? What symbols are present? What historical information would aid understanding this piece? So we've already made important elements and detailed notes. Um, we're going to write some of those notes down here and we're also going to add some more detailed questions. So I'm going to give a few examples. I'm going to say um, each side of the painting corresponded with a different country. On the left we have Mexico and items associated with Mexico and on the right we have America and items associated with America. Frida's arms are crossed, showing that she experiences a conflict um, between the two. So the reason I say that is because having crossed arms kind of notifies to me that she's uncomfortable. That's like a posture that people make when they're not, um, they're not comfortable. So it suggests to me that she's unhappy, as well as the facial expression. So a question I might ask to go along with that would be, um, I'm kind of curious what city she lived in because she's viewing it as like a very polluted, um, structured place when there's plenty of places in America that are very open and not polluted. So I'm going to say, what city did she live in when she was in America? So it's up to you to add your own notes and add your own questions. 
Then come down here. Consider what the title and any written elements of the text suggest about meaning. How does the title relate to what is being portrayed? So consider what the title is and consider what the picture shows. What do you think she is trying to say about the subject? And that will give you your info to fill in here. For interrelationships, it says look for the connections between and among the title, caption, and parts of the art. How are the different elements related? Well, I don't really see a caption, but I do see a title, I do see parts of the art. So I'm going to explain how those different things are related to one another. How is that title demonstrated throughout parts of the art? Then here it says form a conclusion about the meaning or theme of the text. Remember the questions you asked when you first examined it. Be prepared to support your conclusions with evidence. So you're trying to figure out what the meaning of this text is. What is the author trying to say to you? And why do you think that? So for number nine, it says, how did the information about the artist's life help you to understand the artwork? So think about that. How did that little blurb before we saw the picture kind of give us some background information about how she was feeling when she created that art? Um, I'm going to take a second to point out that we have a vocab term over here. I would like for you to add it to your um, exam review for the end of the unit, which will make it a lot easier for you um, when it comes time to do your exam review when you have these definitions filled in already. Then here it says, what is the conflict presented in the artwork? Provide examples from the text to support your analysis. Now when it says text, it's talking about the painting, even though it says text. So you're going to explain what conflict, what problem um, the author is portraying, and then you're using examples from that picture to support your opinion. Then down here, you're being asked a question to check your understanding. How does Frida Kahlo's painting, Self-Portrait on the Borderline between Mexico and the United States, represent her cultural identity? Write an interpretive response and provide examples from the text, including Kahlo's symbolism, to support your analysis. So, think about if you were in Frida Kahlo's position. You, you are from Mexico, but you've been in America for a while. What would your cultural identity be if you were in that situation? Um, and then that can maybe help you understand how Frida Kahlo must have identified culturally. So you'll be writing an interpretive response and providing examples to support your analysis of her cultural identity. Then down here, we have a setting of purpose for reading, so we're getting ready to read something else. So every writer has a unique voice. You have learned that voice is the distinctive use of a writer's language, achieved in part through diction and syntax to convey persona or personality. The term voice is also used to express cultural identity. Read the poem several times and use metacognitive markers to examine the voice used in the text. So remember those metacognitive markers earlier. If you need to go back and review them, um, do so. And then we're also, as always, circling words and phrases that we do not know in order to try to determine their meaning. So this poem is called Legal Alien by Pat Mora. Now, in this case, this doesn't mean an alien from outer space, like E.T. or Marvin the Martian. They're using alien to mean a person from another country, a foreign person. Um, so let's look at what the text says. Bilingual, bicultural, able to slip from how's life to me están volviendo loca, able to sit in a paneled office drafting memos in smooth English, able to order in fluent Spanish at a Mexican restaurant, American but hyphenated, viewed by Anglos as perhaps exotic, perhaps inferior, definitely different, viewed by Mexicans as alien. Their eyes say, you may speak Spanish, but you're not like me. An American to Mexicans, a Mexican to Americans, a handy token sliding back and forth between the fringes of both worlds by smiling, by masking the discomfort of being prejudged bilaterally. So I think there's a lot of cool stuff going on in this poem, so let's examine it in a little bit more depth. So to begin with, I wanted to point out that she uses a type of um, repetition by using bilingual, bicultural, and then at the very end, ties it all together with bilaterally. As we know, and if you don't know, you can look up here, the word bi comes from Latin, and it means either both or two. So with this, she's saying two languages, two cultures. 
And then you may not know what lateral means, but bilaterally means two sides, meaning there's two sides to who she is. So then we have various comparisons. On this side, I'm going to be putting arrows suggest are pointing to the things that suggest her American heritage. And then on the other side, I'm going to put things that suggest her Mexican heritage. So here she says, able to slip from house life, so that's American, to me están volviendo loca, able to sit in a paneled office, drafting memos in smooth English, that's American, ordering influence Spanish at a Mexican restaurant, American but hyphenated, meaning like Mexican-American, viewed by Anglos as perhaps exotic, perhaps inferior, so those are two opposites, exotic is a positive thing, inferior is a negative thing, but definitely different, and that's a neutral. Viewed by Mexican as alien, their eyes say, you may speak Spanish, which is a positive thing, but you're not like me, so those are on the Mexican side. And Americans and Mexicans, this is Mexican perspective, a Mexican to Americans. A handy token sliding back and forth between the fringes of both worlds. By smiling, so that's a positive thing, I'm going to highlight that because I want to point that out. By masking the discomfort, it's a negative thing. Of being prejudged bilaterally. So here I have the contradiction between smiling and um, masking the discomfort that I wanted to point out because you have a positive thing here, smiling. We associate smiling with being happy and then masking the discomfort, we associate that with being negative because you're hiding your emotions and your emotions are negative. So we have a lot going on here. We have most of the lines are divided pretty cleanly between Mexican and American, just like how the person speaking in this poem also feels divided in between Mexican and American, not feeling like they fit in with either side. So let's go down to these questions. For number 11, it says, what is the meaning of the word alien as it's used in the title of the poem? And what is the meaning as it's used in line 11? Well, we already talked about this a little bit. So um, consider what uh, I said and then use that in order to determine your answer here. For number 12, it says, what's implied in lines five through seven by the different activities performed in English and Spanish? So you're going to want to go back to lines five through seven at those activities and analyze what kind of implication they're making. Like, what are they trying to get you to understand? For number 13, it says, as you saw in Frida Kahlo's artwork, juxtaposition, and this is an important word for you to remember because you're gonna see it again and again. Juxtaposition is the arrangement of two or more things for the purpose of comparison. Identify places where Mora juxtaposes two contrasting views, situations, or actions. So there were several instances there that we pointed out. How does she use this technique throughout the poem to create a sense of the speaker's conflict with others or her conflicted sense of self? So as you're looking at those things, ask yourself, how are those things, how do those things contribute to the idea that the speaker is feeling conflicted between uh, the way others perceive her and the way she perceives herself? And then here for 14 it says, how does Pat Mora represent cultural identity in this poem? So, how do you think, what, what comment do you think Pat Mora is trying to make on cultural identity? What do you think Pat Mora's cultural identity is? Or what message do you think Pat Mora is trying to say about cultural identity? Now down here, you're not going to be working with a group, but I do want you to answer the questions that are the activity that is down here. So it says for you to create a diagram to synthesize information about the art in the poem to answer these questions. So this can be any kind of diagram you want. It could be a T-chart, it could be like a uh, Venn diagram, whatever kind of diagram you prefer. But you're answering these questions. What is emphasized in the art? What is emphasized in the poem? What ideas and images are present in the poem but absent from the art? And then what ideas or images are present in the art but absent from the poem? Then down here, you are asked to write an explanatory essay that explores the similarities and differences in the cultural identity of the artist Frida Kahlo and the poet Pat Mora as expressed in the painting and the poem. So be sure that you hit all four of these things, beginning with a clear thesis that states your view of the sim overall similarities and differences between the cultural identities of the two, 
include direct quotations and specific examples from both the painting and the poem, introduce and punctuate all quotations correctly, use a coherent organizational structure and employ transitions effectively to highlight similarities and differences, and use an appropriate voice and a variety of phrases to add interest in your writing. So when you write this essay, you need a minimum of four paragraphs, including an introduction and a conclusion. So keep that in mind, and then I'm going to upload a separate spot for you to put this essay um, onto Edmodo. Then, what you're going to be doing now is you're going to pick one of these two things to do. So you could either do the artistic prompt or you could do the creative writing prompt. You don't have to do both. So the artistic prompt says, what would a self-portrait say about your perspective on your own cultural identity? Create an artistic work that portrays aspects of this identity. You might revisit your perception box from activity 1.2 as you consider objects to include in your self-portrait. Also consider techniques and specific images you can use as evidence to depict and or symbolize potential conflicts that arise when various aspects of your culture collide. Because artwork, like literature, speaks to an audience, keep in mind the message you want your audience to read as they view your work. The second thing, if you don't want to do the art one, is a creative writing prompt. It says, write a poem emul emulating the style of Pat Mora and exploring your perspective on a key component of your cultural identity. Be sure to focus on a specific culturally based conflict, which may be internal, external, or both. Structure the poem to use juxtaposition for effect at least once and use diction, syntax, and imagery to present your own voice. So these are your two choices. So this concludes the activity and it also concludes week two for English 2 semester one. I hope this was informative and if you have any questions remaining, please feel free to reach out to me. I would be glad to assist you. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video.